You're listening to episode 193 of the Tennis Files podcast on how to level up your game at Tennis Summit 2021. Today's episode is brought to you by Tennis Summit 2021. That's right. This is your host, Mirabhan Aranshad, and I am hosting Tennis Summit 2021 starting on April 19th. For over 40 world class coaches and experts will reveal proven secrets to level up your tennis game. I have gotten over 40 of the best coaches on the planet, and they're going to teach you online lessons, presentations, and master classes and live streams on technique, strategy, fitness, and the mental game from April 19th through April 24th. And you can register at Tennis Files Summit. Dot com. That's T E N N I S F I L E S S U M M I T dot com, Tennis File Summit dot com. And when you go to that page, you'll see all the sessions, every single one, every single topic. Uh, it's, it's really massive. And you can just click any of the green buttons on that page, and then you'll get to be registered for free to watch. The summit. So it's going to be really amazing. Uh, just a few of the names here Paul Anacone, Craig O'Shaughnessy, who I just was uh, spoke over the phone with um, a couple hours ago to confirm. Got Nick Boliteri, Ian Westerman, Peter Freeman, Will Hamilton, Dr. Mark Kovacs, Jorge Capistani. Uh, just so many names. So just go to tennisfilesummit.com and also check the link in, on the show notes page. And you will really enjoy uh, this summit that I have dedicated the last probably three months, uh, more if you count, uh, you know, thinking and brainstorming to, to just improve every part of your game with these online lessons. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And I can't wait to see you there. So again, tennisfilesummit.com. Register right now. Hey everyone. Again, this is Mirabon. And today I have a preview of sorts for the summit where I conducted a couple interviews and um, got a couple presentations already for the summit in advance. And so I'm going to give you a little preview of three of them. Uh, And the first one is with legendary coach Paul Anacone, uh, who coached Roger Federer, Pete Sampras, uh, and many other great champions. Tim Henneman and Sloan Stevens as well. And he's going to talk about how to level up your game and get unstuck. So we have a nice conversation there, about 15 minutes or so for this podcast. And like I said before, if you want to watch the full videos of all of these, then go to tennisfilesummit.com. And then the second one is with another legendary coach, Rick Macy, on Grand Slam Habits and Training Secrets to Transform Your Game. And he has coached Venus and Serena Williams, Andy Roddick, Maria Sharapova, and and many hundreds of world-class professionals. So that's going to be a great one. Give you a similar time length uh, preview for that uh, with my conversation with him. And then the third one is uh, with Ryan Reedy from Two Minute Tennis, and he's going to talk about doubles positioning. So we'll give you a similarly length preview of that session as well. So you will get a lot of value just from these these previews here, and I hope you really enjoy them. And so without further ado, here are the previews of the amazing Summit sessions, there are three of them, for this year. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the special interview with legendary coach Paul Anacone on how to level up your tennis game. Uh, it's always a pleasure and, and an honor to speak with Paul. Uh, as you probably know, Paul has coached some of the greatest uh, tennis players on the planet, including uh, Roger Federer, Pete Sampras, Sloane Stevens, and Tim Henman. And he was also an amazing player himself, reaching number 12 in the world in singles and number three in doubles. And we've seen Paul all the time on Tennis Channel. And uh, I'm just really excited to bring him on to to talk to you about how you can get unstuck and, you know, just some great golden nuggets of wisdom from uh, such a legendary coach. So, uh, Paul, thanks so much for coming on and really appreciate your time today. No, thanks for juggling. I know my schedule's been bouncing around a lot, so I appreciate your patience and flexibility. So what do you got for me? 
Oh, yeah. I got some great questions for you, Paul, straight from the audience here. So the first one is kind of what I alluded to uh, in the intro, which is what are your thoughts on how we can get unstuck? You know, we've got players all around the world who are, let's say, 3-0 players, and they want to get to that next level of the 3-5 or 4-0 and so forth. So what tips do you have regarding that? I think the simple theme is regardless of how good you are, you have to understand your own game, you know, understand your game style, uh, what makes you successful um, and what things you need to work on to kind of shore up. But too many people go right to what they don't do well and then spend a lot of time on that. And when you do that, particularly at a club level, the danger is that you forget what makes you a very formidable opponent and you forget what your strengths are. So know what your game is, understand how to maximize your strengths and make it your goal to figure out how to finish each point doing what you do best. That's your goal. Very simply. If you can do that, then you're going to find a way to improve your level of play. You're probably going to improve your enjoyment a lot. And then you get a really good coach or a teacher that can help shore up your weaknesses, but don't spend so much time on your weaknesses that you forget about what makes you a good tennis player. Yeah, great stuff there, Paul. And I'm just curious, you mentioned that, um, you know, a lot of players, they end up gravitating towards things that won't really end up helping them gain the most that they could. What is the reason for that in your experience? I I think it's a good, you know, I think it's actually usually a good reason. I think players genuinely and generally want to get better and they want to get better, which means what's most apparent to them is what they don't do well. So really important to understand what you don't do well, spend some time on it. But the thing is, when you spend too much time on what you don't do well, you have a tendency to get negative. It gets a little depressing and a little disappointing. And you forget what makes you a good tennis player. You forget what your strengths are. So you have to have that balance. But in general, it's people just wanting to get better. Yeah, great stuff, Paul. And and you know, I guess there there are some players who I don't know whether it's like a lack of confidence or if it's reality, but they feel like they they can't even figure out what they do well. So how about for those players? What do you recommend that they do to start getting on that path for improvement? Yeah, that's one of the most important things at every level is understanding your own game style. What do you do well? What do you enjoy doing? Is it serving? Is it using your big forehand? Is it using your footwork to stay in rallies and be a very good counterpuncher? Nothing is right or wrong. It's all about what works for you. It's all about what's successful and understanding that. So for me, it's finding a very good teacher finding someone that you can trust and you rely on who can help you kind of categorize and characterize your game and just build from there. Thanks a lot for that, Paul. And so let's say, you know, there are quite a bit of um, (laughs) do-it-yourselfers to some extent, and I definitely advocate for finding a great coach to help you like Paul. But uh, let's say the, you know, a player, they want to actually get into uh, the mode of finding out what they do well and what they don't do well. Is there any sort of um, system that you might have for for deciding uh, how to actually do that? Well, I mean, just one of the simplest systems is is human nature, and it's your feeling. Uh, Generally, uh, for all of us, we like to do what we do well. So whatever you feel good doing on the tennis court, that's probably your strength. So if that's the case, then figure out how to do that. If it's using that big forehand, find ways to create patterns so that you can use the big forehand to dictate the points and ultimately finish the points. Um, So really just circle back to what feels good when you're playing. And if you can really identify that, that's probably what you're doing well. Thanks, Paul. And so... Uh, to shift to strategy and game plans, uh, we all know that it's extremely important to construct game plans. I remember talking to James Blake and he mentioned that he uh, inexplicably never got nervous, but that was because he always constructed a game plan and visualized. So I was wondering if you have any tips, and I know some of it's related to what we just talked about, but what is the approach that, that amateur players should take when they're constructing a game plan? Well, it's it's a lot like we have just talked about. But, you know, one of the things that amateur players have to realize is that no matter where you're playing, whether it's Roger Federer or center court at Wimbledon or you at your local club, everyone gets nervous. 
um, and the nerves can creep in and create doubt, uh, insecurity, and indecision in your game. What what formulating a game plan does is it allows you to focus on something other than the result. So if you can formulate a plan in your mind of how you want to play each point, of what you're trying to do instead of what happens when you do it, you can then start to grade yourself on how well you're staying with that process. And if you're staying with the process well, and you can start to really figure out what's being successful and what isn't while you're playing, you're probably, number one, going to relax. Number two, your focus is going to steer clear of the consequences or perceived consequences of what you're doing, and it's going to allow you to stay on track to executing that game plan. Thanks, Paul. And I was wondering if we could get a, uh, a concrete example, and I'd love to maybe explore uh, your playing days, and maybe if you could think back to a particular match that you played against an opponent on the tour, or really anywhere, where you you devised the game plan, and then that strategy was the key to your success, and then if you could kind of give us so, you know, the, the inside scoop on uh, what strategies developed and uh, you developed and why and then how it worked. Sure. I mean, the danger is um, trying to be too kind of broad stroke. So for me, it was really simple. I had to get to the net a lot. And my brother coached me um, and, and he basically would say, if you find yourself at the net at the end of most of the points, whether you're winning or losing them, you're probably playing the right way. So for me, it was simple. How many points am I finishing at the net? How many points um, are am I able to kind of execute to come forward? Then within that, after the match, we talk about execution. You weren't hitting your approach shots well, or you were hitting your approach shots well. You weren't sticking your first volleys, or you were. So the first things first is, is to kind of evaluate what makes it really simple for you to figure out if you're playing the right style. Um, and everybody can do this. Like I said, the pros can do it. You can do it at your club. You want to evaluate how often are you getting either aces or unreturnable serves. If you're a great returner, you want to evaluate, am I getting enough balls in play to start the point? Um, like I mentioned before, if you've got the big forehand, how many times am I finishing the point using that big forehand? So you just plug those in to whoever you're playing against and figure out how it matches up. But it's not that complex of an equation. Once you evaluate the strategy, then you can go back and kind of reevaluate the execution level. And then you go out to the practice courts and figure out how to get better at it. Yeah, great stuff, Paul. And in terms of um, keeping track of, of some of those metrics, I know that that can be or feel like a, maybe a daunting task for amateur players. And I know ideally, again, we'd want a, a coach or somebody else helping with that. But uh, are there any methods or you know apps or anything else that you would suggest for that, that players could use or methodologies that they could use to, to track what they're doing on the court? Sure. I mean, with total transparency, I, I'm an investor and in, in, uh, participate in PlaySight, which is which is a great one of the technology apps that you can do a lot with in terms of speed of shot, um, RPMs on the ball, um, court positioning patterns that you are executing. So I think there's a lot of different apps and there's a lot of different possibilities out there. I would just caution everybody to not get so wrapped up in the analytics and the metrics that you forget the simple strategic stuff behind the numbers because numbers in isolation or the strategy behind it in isolation don't really work anymore in today's day and age. It's when you marry the two, it's when you put them together, that's when it becomes a very lethal weapon in terms of trying to get better. Thanks for that, uh, Paul. And in terms of um, questions that I received, one of the biggest ones are how to deal with nerves. And I, I spoke with Ilya Marchenko uh, very recently, and he mentioned that the top players, as you know, we know, like Nadal, uh, Djokovic, and Federer, they even they experience nerves, and I'm sure that you, that you did as well. So I was wondering, you know, especially on those uh, those very important points. So what is the key to being able to deal with those nerves, and then even p perhaps thriving uh, in spite of them? Yeah, I think I sound like a broken record, but it really is about getting away from the result orientation. It's about forgetting that it's 30-40 at five all in the third set. Okay, forget that. What you want to remember is, okay, what do I want to do this point? 
What, what am I trying to do? Well, if my opponent misses a first serve, I want to be really aggressive on the return of serve. If my opponent, if you're a you know, steady player, it's I want to get into the rally. The thing that works for all different styles of play is really at the big moments, two things. Make sure you're really active with your footwork because when you get nervous, it's very easy to get cement feet and get stuck in the court. And make sure that you maintain big targets. You want to stick to your patterns, but go to big targets in the court so that you allow for a little bit more margin for error because of the nerves. And as you do that, you'll see you get better and better at it. And you can start to near, narrow the targets down a little bit and become more aggressive. And that's what the great players do. They trust their targets under big pressure. Um, you know, so Roger does. Rafa has built in safeguards because he has so much margin on his ground strokes. Novak's movement and simplicity of his stroke production is very repeatable. So that holds up under pressure. But again, in some way, shape or form, all you folks at home are part of that style of play that I just talked about. One of those three styles will be you at some level, probably a different level. Otherwise, you'd be out on the tour. But um, you have to plug that in. But the biggest theme is good footwork and big targets under pressure. So, Paul, in terms of the big targets, just to give the audience kind of a visual, um, what, what are your favorite big targets on the court? Well, so simple themes would be, you know, go over the low part of the net, so most time you're probably going to be staying cross court in the rally as often as possible. That's the lowest part of the net and the biggest portion of the court to hit to if you're going cross court. So you want to go over the low part of the net, giving yourself some good margin and try to go to a big circle in the back of the court. You still want to get it past the service line, but instead of trying to be really deep in the court, instead of going, I'm, I'm just going to guess here, but instead of going in a three foot circle, give yourself a six foot circle that you're trying to hit the ball to. And just do that repeatedly because that lets you get into the rally, give you an opportunity to get an unforced error from your opponent and maybe get a short ball. If you don't get that unforced error, then you can go for a high percentage offensive shot. So Paul, in terms of, um, in terms of hitting offensive versus defensive shots, you know, we do have, uh, of course, many players who kind of struggle with their shot selection. So what types of um, principles do you kind of think about when determining whether a player uh, should be hitting a neutral ball or a more defensive ball or, or an offensive ball? Well, to break it down really simply, the closer you are to the baseline and the more you are in the middle of the court and close to the baseline, the more options you have. If you're on the baseline right at that hash mark in the middle of the court, you can do whatever you want because regardless of where you hit the ball, you're in a good position to recover for the next ball. What too many club players do is they'll be out wide in the court close to one of the doubles alleys and try to go down the line over the high part of the net where even if it goes in, your opponent's got a huge target to hit to that you'll struggle to defend with. So a couple simple themes – Look where you're standing in the court when you hit the ball. If it's close to the baseline, then you can be aggressive. If you're deep in the court, give yourself high margin over the net for two reasons, to get the ball deep, number one. Number two, to give yourself the opportunity to move up closer to the baseline after hitting that ball so you can then get back on offense. So court positioning is key, and going over the low part of the net is vital. Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, this session with legendary coach Rick Macy. Uh, it's really an honor to be able to speak with Rick once again. Uh, he's just coached so many amazing world number one players, and uh, his players have won well over 300 uh, USTA national championships. Uh, so you know all about Rick. Uh, and please check out his uh, academy, the Rick Macy Tennis Academy in Boca Raton, Florida. Uh, Rick, it's really an honor to speak with you, and thank you so much for joining me. Ah, thanks for having me. I love to help all the guys, and uh, if we're all getting better, it's great for the game of tennis. For sure, Rick. Well, uh, I want to just fire away and ask you some questions about the Grand Slam habits. And so, first off, I want to start not by examining uh, your players that you've coached, but by by speaking and asking you about your Grand Slam uh, champion habits. So I want to ask you, uh, you know, you're a very disciplined person. You're an action taker. So what are some of the most important habits that you perform in your daily life? 
Um, <laughs> you should ask my kids that because uh, I'm probably one of the most structured human beings ever to walk the face of the earth. You know, I think when you have a routine, uh, you're going to have a lot more discipline. And when you have that, you become machine like and then you expect it from yourself. And when you expect it from yourself, because let's face it, at the end of the day, it's a game within a game and it's you competing against yourself. But I think having structure in your life and discipline and focus and not being all over the map and, uh, you know, it's worked for me. You know, I've got up at 3.30 every day for the last probably 25 years. And, you know, I run a half mile every morning and, you know, open up the park about 5.15 and just getting into routine and, but that only happens also if you, if you love something and, you know, I just love to help people and I love to coach and it doesn't matter if it's a three-year-old or someone on the ATP tour. So I think having structure and becoming machine-like, it makes you mentally stronger and it empowers yourself. And when you have power of the mind, you have power of everything. 100% Rick. And you, you know, you're so experienced. You've lived a very uh, long and uh, very fruitful life. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, on the flip side, are there any particular habits that, you know, you found over the years that perhaps you eliminated because you found that they were interfering with your goals and aspirations in tennis? Um, well, I, I think the main thing is just being able to focus. You know, I think that's number one. But number two, you don't worry about the little things. Don't, you know, make a big deal out of everything. Uh, knowing when to keep your, your mouth shut. I think that's a, that's a big thing, especially when you're dealing with, uh, you know, junior tennis and parents and uh, knowing how to, you know, just speak to people and communicate differently and treat everybody like you'd like to be treated. And, uh, you know, even though I've been around the block and, you know, I've had a lot of success with a lot of players and, uh, you know, kids that have had success, whether it be national titles or people have done good on the pro tour or won grand slams, you know, just come across, you know, a lot of humility and trying to get better every day. Uh, that's what I try to do, but treat everybody like you'd like to be treated. And uh, I think it goes a long way because we are in the service business, you know, and a lot of times people have success and they talk down to people or they don't know how to get along with people. And I think when you can communicate like that and people feel that, I think you can really come up with a special combination as not only a coach, but as a teacher and a role model. Yeah, definitely, Rick. Really appreciate that uh, awesome advice. And so in regards to, you know, as we mentioned, you've coached some incredible players have won, you know, uh, tons of grand slams. What are some of the notable habits that you found that are were present in these particular players, you know, like Serena, Andy, Maria, et cetera, that perhaps are not found in, in, in most players that you, that you think were able to help them distinguish themselves from other players? First off, that's a great question. You know, people ask me all around the world uh, in the media for really the last you know, 40 years, you know, what's the difference or, um, what's one common thread that you see with Capriotti, Roddick, Sharapova, Mesquina, Pierce, uh, you know, the Williams sisters, Kennan, and they all do everything very different, grips, backswing, so on and so forth. But I think the burning desire, the thirst for competition, and the passion that they have for the love of the game, because when you love something, it's going to be fun. And that's going to help you weather the good times, the bad times, the ups and downs, because nothing's a straight line in life. So I think that's the only real common thread that I've seen with not only those type players, but people that have had success at high school level or college level, or people that I know in the NBA or NFL or, you know, hockey. It's just, it's that, just trying to get better every day. The, the thirst for competition, always trying to get up earlier, trying to get the edge on the competition, uh, loving just the competition, anybody, anytime, anywhere mentality. Uh, hopefully I've infiltrated, you know, their brain a little bit with uh, everything that I try to have in my teaching. But that was one thing 
that a lot of them already had baked in even before they came to me. How you get it, you can't buy it, you can't go to Walgreens, you know, it, it's just it's more of an innate thing. But if you love something, the rest will follow. Love that, Rick. So how about the situation? And, you know, you mentioned that you, you can't buy this sort of passion for the sport. But what about if you have somebody who, you know, is talented and can get there? Uh, you know, a lot of people, I guess, think of Curios, but um, where, you know, the player has a potential and you, you think that, well, maybe this player can rekindle that passion for the game. Uh, so, so how do you go about, you know, for those particular particular players to actually get that passion back so that they can actually achieve what is possible for them? Uh, did you mention curios? Yeah. No, you know, I think that's, well, that's a whole, that's a whole different animal. I mean, I could talk about that for a long time, but listen, he is what he is. He's a performer. He's a magician. He's an artist. He's one of the most talented guys on the tour. And that's just how he's wired. You don't think people try to change, work harder, you know, get mad. Listen, that works for him. And, you know, unfortunately, you got Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, and Murray, or Murray that were all around at the same time, or he'd probably have a few grand slams, even being the way that he is. So, I, I think you got to look past that. You could say the same thing about Monfils and maybe a couple other great athletes, but you know, maybe you try to put them in a box and then you take away their greatness. Um, Cause I'm sure everybody has told him just kind of some of the things, but I think he has great passion for the game, but wor- what works for him, he's doing as long as he's happy. That's, that's, you know, what it's all about. But I think, motivating people and extracting greatness out of people. Cause obviously I work with kids age five, all the way up to people on the pro tour and more, but getting them to believe and get looking at the big picture and really trying to inspire them to uh, it's a long-term process. It's a journey. Uh, the practice is where you get better. That's where you make mistakes. That's where you learn. You break things, everything down to its minute point. And then when you play the game, it's on feel and instinct. And I think that's really important. And that's why I keep the kids always wanting to improve, working on your game. And, you know, a, a quote I coined long ago, it's called junior development, not junior final destination. So it's a long-term process. And a lot of that can be instilled by the coach, no doubt. Definitely, uh, Rick. And yeah, I mean, really important point that you mentioned about, uh, you know, it's all about breaking down, you know, what's maybe not working and then uh, improving that. So what's your what's your process for that? Uh, You know, when you look at a student, uh, how do you go about analyzing uh, their game? And then how do you go about breaking things down as well to help them improve? Another great question. And it really depends on a multitude of factors. Obviously, if it's a four-year-old, it's going to be different than an eight-year-old or someone on the pro tour, you know, depending on where their skill set is, where they're at technically, where they're at genetically, where they're at strategically. So I can't just throw a net out there and answer the question. So I look at someone and then I evaluate where they're at genetically, how they move, where their technique is at, because I work with a lot of people on biomechanics especially the kids 12 and under. And I, I love trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again and, you know, break it down and tear it apart and rewire the whole nervous system. I love that challenge of reprogramming the reflexes and changing the muscle memory. And that's the art of coaching. Uh, it's not just motivation or tactics or strategy, which everybody might have their strengths, but I really enjoy that part of it and building a weapon. So I think that with young kids, the technical parts are most important. And that's in the eye of the beholder, because what might be a good forehand to you, maybe wouldn't to me or vice versa. So um, and then knowing how to how to put it together and, you know, what their goals are, what their potential is. Maybe they just want to play high school tennis. But if someone has aspirations of being world class or I think they can be a top 10 player, I'm going to uncover every stone. I'm going to do everything possible of every detail and put the stroke together so I can get a Federer like forehand. I'm just generalizing or a Djokovic backhand or a Roddick serve 
So technically, it's going to hold up more under pressure because the strokes you're dealt with at a young age, they're pretty much with you for a lifetime. You know, I see the same mistake on Venus's forehand as I saw at age 14. So, but the hole is smaller. And when you're confident, you can hide it. But when you're nervous, it all percolates to the top. So I think the technical part is what I look at more than anything. And I have a methodology I put together and, you know, it's all cutting edge. It's based on science. It's all backed up by fact. And, you know, I put some great weapons on the kid, you know, and if I could put it on a thoroughbred instead of a donkey, there's going to be a better chance that they have unlimited potential, but the strokes can last a lifetime. And I love building weapons, but also the genetic part, you know, what's the DNA of the kid? Did her mom play sports, dad play sports, grandfather play sports, NBA, NFL. All this goes into my thinking. And then when I go out there, I just react. And whatever bubbles up in front of me, I immediately address. Okay. And it might take a long time to put it together. Like I have this one girl who came at eight years old. They moved her from New York, number one in the country now crazy forehand technique, straight arm, world-class backhand. She served better than half the girls on the tour already technically, but it took a long time. I work with her every day for four years, but I put together just a great, great technical base. And I put it on a world-class athlete. As her mom silver, silver medaled in the Olympics and ice dancing. So it'll be interesting to see how that all pans out, but it's not an easy question to answer. It depends on who's in front of me. And it takes time and it's a selling point, just that alone to the parents. Thanks for that. Rick. Thanks for that. Yeah, Rick. It's, it's yeah. very difficult to, uh, to change, uh, you know, technique, but, uh, you know, you're the master. I always remember that tip that you give where, you know, one of the biggest flaws, uh, on the serve is that, uh, individuals perform too early of a racket drop and they should sync it with the pushing up of their legs. So, uh, you know, I always tell people about that tip and that you, you told me about it, um, and many others, of course. Um, so uh, one thing, Rick, that I want to ask you in regards to to, to training, uh, it, you know, even though even if you have the passion for the sport and you want it, you know, there's always going to be these days where you still, you know, you may not feel up to the task or, or um, you know, the willpower may not be as strong as usual. So in those cases, what do Grand Slam champions do differently? How do they approach it differently than the normal population that enables them to still train at a very high intensity and, and make the right decisions uh, in these types of situations? First off, another great question. I mean, the people that are great uh, or Grand Slam champions or you know, at the top of their field, they're wired different when they don't feel good or they have a headache or a sore throat or they don't want to get up. Those are the days they probably do more and it probably makes their mind stronger. Like I said earlier, it's a game within a game and it actually is what it isn't. This is how these people think because they know and they're scared because it's not really where they're at it's who's coming from behind and you know, like the you know the late great Kobe Bryant said you know he's getting up at 3 30 and he's in the gym and his mind's getting stronger because everybody else is still sleeping and that empowered him you know it's the inner beast inside people just think different and I like to tell the kids that's a choice you know I try to give them all the references I have through my lifetime of how these people are wired you know, kind of how I'm wired. I try to lead by example. I mean, if you're going to say it, you better <laughs> lead by example, but it, it, it's a choice. If you think of all that, it comes down to a choice. When the alarm rings, get out of bed. You know what I mean? Don't sit there for, or lay there for 20 minutes. And, you know, it, everything's a choice. What you eat, what you say, how you empower themselves. And these people are the most positive people ever. They empower themselves with words, just like whatever they eat. You are what you eat, or you also what you say and what you hear. Uh, it's the mental game. They're the, the greatest of all time or the most positive also. And you can take that to the bank. So when I can sing that song or preach that sermon to the kids, or they're around the environment that I've created at the academy, uh, you know, it's not in the water that, uh, you know, I've had like four 
kids that moved here when they're eight years old and all four of them at one time have become became number one in the nation in the 12s just the past four years i mean they came with something but it had to be molded and then baked and the icing put on it whether they'll be world-class players they'll play on the pro tour but as you climb that ladder it's different but just changing their attitude you know one more one more i say one more is the guy who won more all right and it's what you do on your day off you never have an off day and you have to look at it different and when people say oh i play every day well you don't play every day because you might play a couple hours and you sleep and you eat and you do this and that so you played maybe a couple hours that day you didn't play all day or you play 24 hours that day so when everybody says that listen these people think different and if you think different you'll be different and if you're different you have a better chance to be successful on or off the court Beautifully put, Rick. And, uh, you know, in terms of, of training properly, uh, and, and let me know if you need kind of a more concrete example because I have one ready, but what are the the elements, the critical elements of a of a efficient and effective practice that you think, you know, let's say 4-0 players, they're, maybe they're having trouble closing out matches and they want to get better at that. You know, what, what, what should they keep in mind when they go out with a friend and they go to practice, but they want to have a good practice? What are some elements to keep in mind? Uh, five things. Have fun. Have fun. <laughs> have fun. Have fun and they can figure out number five but all these other things take you away from having fun mistakes then you lead to frustration hmm. i did better last time so when you enjoy it and you can flip it in your mind because you asked me specifically about a 4-0 player and that's why i responded that way because i think the club players you know they get more nervous because they don't do it as much and they're not technically as sound and you know, they haven't been around the block. So just have fun, having a great attitude, whether you're having your worst day or best day, it's windy, it's hot, it's cold, enjoy it. You know, it starts with attitude. I'm gonna tell you right now, if people would smile when they hit the ball, they do a lot better at the club level. And some people say, smile, how, how can I smile? I didn't do anything good. No, you can smile if you want to, because smiling has a tremendous effect on your nervous system. And everybody says the same thing. If I told people to smile and hit the ball, if I told 100,000 people that over my lifetime, 100,000 people said the same thing. I feel more relaxed. But who wants to smile when the ball's coming at you and you're, you want to win the point? So you let the situation control you instead of you controlling the situation. So that'd be my advice. I know it sounds benign or vanilla or maybe even stupid to people but it's so true because when you can control the inside and flip it or reverse engineer it now you can control the outside and it's a different way to look at it but this is what these guys do at the top in men's tennis they can flip it in their mind and they enjoy it they're not thinking about i'm blowing it they're not thinking about anything else they all choke, they all get nervous, but the great ones in any sport don't do it as much. And that'd be the tip of the century for every club player that sees this. And they're gonna say, well, I can't go out there and smile. Well, I'm just telling you the secret sauce, try it and I guarantee they'll play a lot better. Welcome, my name is Ryan Reedy, founder of twominutetennis.net. And in this video, I'm gonna share 10 simple tips to help you win more doubles matches. Let's get right to it. Tip number one, where to stand when the point begins. I watch so many recreational players at the club where I coach every single week, give themselves a huge disadvantage by where they stand to start the point. So let's get this right, right off the bat. When you are the server, you can't stand in the middle like you are playing singles. You've got to stand farther over. Anywhere from three to five feet inside the singles line is a great place to stand. It allows you to hit the T and out wide, but it also helps you get a sharp cross-court return. Your job is to cover that ball, so standing farther over is going to help you do that. When you're the returner, you got to make sure that you stand far enough back that you have time, ample time, 
to react to your opponent's serve, especially if it's really fast. I watch a lot of players, they stand near the baseline because they think that's where they're supposed to be. If your opponent has a really fast serve, you can move back and give yourself more time. And you also have to be equidistant to the T and out wide serve. Many players stand too close to the center and then the out wide serve beats them over and over. Remember, your job is to bisect where they can hit that return. So figure that out based on a case by case basis with what you see the server doing. When it comes to the server's partner, stand directly in the middle of the box. It allows you to poach, but it also allows you to cover down the alley. If you start too far over, sure you're covering the alley, but you can never poach and you're not doing your job as the net person. And when you are the returner's partner, Again, and this is all a basic idea. You can change things as needed, and we're gonna talk about that actually later on in this video. But you're gonna stand on the service line, and if you notice, I don't have it right in the center of the service line. I have it slightly toward the center of the court, and that's just to help cover the middle in case the returner hits to the net player and the net player hits it through the middle. If you start the point, in the correct place, the chances of winning go way up. Now I'm so excited to share tip number two with you because this is gonna help you aim your shots and be right more than 80% of the time. When you're hitting the ball, you can't think of it as random, like, oh, I'm just gonna hit the ball anywhere and no matter where I hit the ball, I have an equal chance of winning the point. It's not how it works. So here is the simplest way to think of aiming strategy. Simply hit the the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. Let me say that again. If you're hitting the ball, just hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing and you will be right more than 80% of the time. Let me explain. See, when you're in the back, and most doubles points occur like this, one up, one back versus one up, one back. When you're in the back, your job is to prolong the point. Your goal is not to end the point, but actually to keep it going. Because if you end the point from the baseline, chances are you're gonna lose the point. I believe on the pro tour, when the baseliner ends the point, they only win the point 25% of the time. That means they're ending the point three out of four times with hitting the net or hitting the ball out. So you don't want to try to end the point from the baseline, usually. You want to prolong it, and the way you do that you hit it to the other team's baseliner. Baseliners should hit to baseliners. Now, the idea is the same at the net. At the net, you you want to hit the ball to the opponent who's standing where you're standing. So if you're at the net, you want to find the other net person. So let's say the ball comes right to you. This You're the server's partner, and the return comes right to you. The number one aiming mistake I see on a daily basis when I watch recreational doubles, is an overhead or a high volley being hit back to the baseliner. That person has more time to react. So you gotta find the person with less time to react, and you do that by hitting it hard at the feet of the other team's net player. Baseliners hit to baseliners. Net players hit to net players. When you follow this strategy 100% of the time, you're gonna be right more than 80% of the time. Don't hit random shots. When you're in the back, find the other back person. Keep the point going. When you're at the net and you can poach and you can hit a strong high volley or overhead, find the person closer to you, the other net person, hit it at their feet, and you're gonna win a ton of points. Now, tip number three is gonna help you play both offense and defense when you're at the net. And the idea is simple. You have to move as if the ball is a magnet and you're being pulled toward the tennis ball. So remember in tip number two, the baseliners are trying to hit it to the other baseliners. And that's a very common thing. And as it should be, that's a very common strategy. You see cross court shots going back and forth from baseliner to baseliner to baseliner. Why? Because you're trying to avoid the net person because the net players end the point with poaches and overheads. So that's a very common occurrence, back and forth cross court. Well, the net players shouldn't just stand there and get a good neck workout watching the ball go back and forth. You also need to move, again, to play both offense 
and defense. So if the ball is going back and forth, and let's say the ball gets hit back to the server. Now, the net players need to move toward the ball. So the server's partner moves back, and the returner's partner now moves forward. If the server does their job and hits it back cross court, avoiding the net player because baseliners should hit to baseliners, if they hit it back cross court to the other baseliner, then they both move again toward the ball. So you're gonna move as if the ball is a magnet and you're being pulled toward the ball. Here's the reason why. Remember, net players should be aiming for the other net player. So if the returner is hitting a ground stroke, right? The, the ball went back and forth and the returner is hitting the ground stroke. The server's partner gets to attack and try to poach the ball. Well, the returner's partner knows that net players aim for net players. So they should move back, buying themselves some time in case something bad happens. And what's that bad thing? The ball is hit a little too close to this net player, they poach it and they follow what they should do, net players aim for net players, and boom, they hit it right at their feet. Now, let's say that doesn't happen. Let's say the, the returner doesn't give an easy sitter to the server's partner, but they end up getting it back again cross court to the server. Well, this player, the returner's partner, no longer is afraid of this person because they're not hitting it. So now they switch jobs. Now the returner's partner attacks and tries to move forward and tries to intercept a cross-court ball. And where should they aim this? They should aim it hard to the feet of the opposing net player. So when you are at the net, the idea is very simple. You simply move as if the ball is a magnet taking turns playing offense and defense. Who's the offensive player right here? Who's the offensive player? This player, which means this player is playing defense, afraid of what might happen. Well, if the returner gets it back cross court, whew, this player doesn't have to worry about a thing now because this player didn't get the ball because their partner did their job in tip two and hit it to the other baseliner. And now they make this move. Simply move up and back as the net players, imagining the ball is a magnet and you're getting pulled toward the magnet and you're gonna play the, both the best offense and defense you ever have at the net. Now tip number four piggybacks off of what we just learned in tip three. And it is very simple. When the ball is behind you, right? So you're a net player if the ball's behind you. When you're a net player and the ball goes behind you, focus on the other team's net player. Watch them very closely because you want to know what they're doing, whether they're just standing and letting the ball go by or whether their racket is going up. Let me explain. You're going to do this actually, the first opportunity to do this is right on the serve. So here comes the serve and it goes to the returner. Now the ball is behind the returner's partner. So where should they be looking? They should be looking at the server's partner. When the ball is behind you, you want to turn your focus on the opponent who can hurt you first. Well, the other team's baseliner, if you're this player, you don't need to worry about this person. They're not even aiming for you anyway. You need to worry about the person who's gonna aim for you, and that's the opposing net player. Now, when the return is hit back cross court to the server, we know to move like the ball is a magnet, so these players, move into their new positions, right? Now this player is playing defense. Here's the offensive net player. And now the server's partner has the ball behind them. When the ball goes behind you, you now focus on the other team's net player because you want to see if they're hitting the ball. Let's say you're looking right at this person and you see them smiling and you see them reach their racket up and they're gonna crush the ball. Well, guess where they're aiming? They should be aiming for you. So if your partner accidentally hits a weak ball right to them and you're looking right at them, 
you're gonna be tipped off to the fact that they're gonna be hitting the ball very quickly, right? You're not gonna be like, oh, I wonder what's happening. You were looking right at them and you saw their racket go up. You know what to do. You now know to move backward. Yes, into no man's land, but you're doing it to buy yourself more time and just frankly, so you don't get hit and like hurt. You don't wanna get hurt. So you move back and if the, <laughs> the ball comes to you, maybe you now have enough time to get it back to the baseliners and then it all resets. You quickly get to move up. This person goes, ah, oh, darn it, they saw me. They saw me put my racket up and then they go back, right? Remember, you're gonna move like the ball's a magnet. So now this player is looking at this player the ball goes cross court, tip number two, baseliners hip to baseliners. They now move like the ball is a magnet. Tip number three, you can see it's all connected, right? It's all connected. It's so cool. I love teaching this stuff because once you start to figure out that it's really the same couple of strategies over and over and over again, it's incredible how many matches you actually start to win. So where is this person looking, right? Where is this person looking? All right, I hope you really enjoyed this episode and the content from these amazing coaches, Paul Anacone, Rick Macy, and Ryan Reedy. Just really top-notch all around and also very, very nice and great people, as are all of the coaches on Tennis Summit 2021. So again, if you're listening to this uh, before the end of April, uh, hopefully the earlier mid-April, then uh, please go to TennisFilesSummit.com. If you are serious about leveling up your tennis game and you have any parts of your strategy, technique, fitness, mental game, or even equipment, actually, that you want to learn more about, improve, and take action upon, then go to (laughs) TennisFileSummit.com. All right. That is it for me for mentioning the summit uh, until next week. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I just want to leave you with a quote as well. And this one is from one of my faves, Lao Tzu. And he said, deal with the big while it is still small. It's a great quote. Uh, My dad always tells me prevention is better than cure, uh, 100%. So uh, just take action on your issues right now before they snowball into a worse off uh, habit or problem. And yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. So I really hope to see you at the summit. And I hope you have a great one. And please be well and stay safe. And As always, get in touch if you have any questions, uh, social media or email, but it's, uh, I'm really, really busy these days, but I'll do my best to answer any of your questions that you might have. All right. This is Mirabon and I am signing out back to work on the summit. Take care.